So you've already been welcomed by Leah, but let me welcome you back to Regent. Thank you and Miranda uh, have done a lot here over the years and influenced lots of people, and I'm glad to call you my friend. Thank you. So we're glad, uh, we're glad you're here. So what, what we're going to do tonight is, um, is I'm going to say some things about Regent and kind of the theological framework that we try to bring to bear. And as has already been mentioned, there's such a symmetry between Arash and Regent's theology, even though we express it in different ways. So, uh, so we're both going to tell some stories and try to get a sense of how these two DNAs fit together as we move into this partnership. So, yeah. so let, me, let me start, Peter, with just a, a little bit of Regent history and uh, kind of then throw it over to you to unpack it a bit on the Arasha side. Back in the 60s, there was a Christian businessman by the name of Marshall Shepard, who often doesn't get much profile in the Regent history, but was a really significant person in the way this place started because as a businessman who had a piety uh, in his Christian life, he came to realize that um, the secular world, as it was understood back in the 60s, was quite removed from the sacred world. So he described back then as looking at the theological landscape and seeing that there was all these theological schools preparing people for pastoral ministry and missions and things in the sacred space, not the secular space. And um, most theological schools in the 60s, that's what they were doing. They were preparing people for that terrible phrase called full-time Christian ministry. And then everyone else was doing something else that was more secular. And his vision, which I think we, we stand on his shoulders still, his vision was that we would uh, be a school that took theology for the whole people of God seriously and didn't divide it into secular and sacred. And I think many of us who've grown up in the evangelical world have seen piety as something with depth. You know, that I'm, I, have, I love God, I seek to pray, I seek to read scripture, and there's a, there's a desire to go deep spiritually. But um, there isn't a lot of breadth sometimes, because the whole secular world sort of gets left out there somewhere. We don't bring our kingdom commitment out there. So, that was, that's one of the major reasons Regent started was to break into this secular sacred split, was to recognize that spirituality was expressed in, in broad ways, not just deep ways, and that that was significant. And I remember early in my time here, I think it was in the year 2000, I met with one of our grads in the US who owns a car dealership. In fact, he owned a number of car dealerships. And he described to me as a Regent grad how he ran his car dealerships. And it was such an interesting juxtaposition because most people don't think of car dealerships as terribly spiritual or sacred or full-time Christian service. But he had this profound understanding of the history of the church, of theology, and how that impacted selling cars. And I remember listening to him and thinking, I've never been in a conversation like this ever with a Christian who really saw the business of selling cars as part of theology, not something removed from theology or in the so-called secular space, but actually in the sacred space. And more and more, as I talk to region grads, we, we have a graduate in Haiti right now, uh, who a number of years ago went down there to work with the clay from Haiti and cereal boxes from Haiti to bake jewelry to support the Haitians, particularly after the various earthquakes that they've had. And now a lot of the designers in New York are buying their stuff and they're making money which is going back to Haiti. And it's this lovely sort of cross-fertilization of things that we used to allocate to the secular arena and not to the sacred arena. So that's so much part of our DNA. That's, that's, our, that's our core for who we are. And my knowledge of Arash and just my knowledge of you, that fits almost hand in glove with what Arash is about. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and funny enough, we come at it from the other direction because it's interesting what you say about founding histories, but at the outset of Arosha, we felt we were faced with a clear choice. We could either operate within this subculture, which was the manifestation of the Christian world, and kind of try and get out of it somehow into the environmental space, or understand ourselves to be within, inevitably within that environmental space as Christians. Mm. And uh, in terms of history, Miranda and I, uh, until recently, were living in France for 14 years. 
and realize just how profoundly religious the secular space is. It is a religion in every way, and yet it's endeavoring to make that religiosity invisible. It's also doctrinaire. And so, curiously, having lived in the secular arena, you realize you're, you're in a religion-drenched environment. Mm. And I think what we're trying to do is to facilitate, um, within the environmental world, some, some more frank conversations about the beliefs that are motivating it. But funny thing is, the environmental world is the corporate boardroom. That's where the envir environmental impacts are having. Uh, it's not that the environmental world is those who lug trees around without stereotyping anybody. <laughs> um, what, what is changing our world is, is people and their visions of what matters and what's important. And if you don't believe me, just try a Google exercise and Google any corporate name you like and then add the words we believe, you will come up with their religious statement. But these religions are founded on so little, they're, they're so flaky, they're so incoherent. And, and the environmental world is, is searching for a compel compelling narrative. And actually it's being torn apart at the moment over the discussion of how can we persuade anybody and even ourselves that nature matters? Why, why does nature matter? You, c you can't say why nature matters unless you're going to start talking. So, so in, a, in an opposite way, we're doing, we're doing the same. The, the map that Marku has just put up there, a very interesting exercise, it's a belief map. The colored areas are where biodiversity is to be found. Essentially, it's actually 2% of the planet's surface. And what we did for the first time was to map uh, where there were Christians living. Because the secular environmental world has realized that if you have a really poor Christian theology, the kind of theology that Regent exists to negate that secular spiritual divide, a kind of Jesus is going to lift this out of here and it's all going to burn theology, then biodiversity is in real trouble because it turns out Christians are the stakeholders in most of those places because it's the global south. And the different colors show the different concentrations. We're only here talking about Christians who acknowledge scripture as their main source. We haven't gone into the Orthodox and Catholic groups who are probably even more important. Mm -hmm. So the Regent Project, which is to understand, first of all, that all of life is deeply religious. And more than that, that the Christian faith makes absolute sense for the person selling cars or running a hairdresser's in Saskatchewan or trying to get a taxi business going in Manila. Those are religious enterprises in, in the deep sense of the world. Um, that has vital practical importance for the future of, of life on Earth. And we're talking in a week after a report came out that uh, has shown that we have lost 50% of the life on Earth in the last uh, 40 years. That was the latest Zoological Society of London WWF report. So we're burning God's library without reading the books. And the reason we're doing it is essentially over a set of beliefs that say the more stuff you have, the happier you're going to be, which is making a desert of our world. And, and Regent is not only giving a really deep, connected, authentic, coherent account of what the Christian faith is, it's saying, and it matters for everything. But I, I want to acknowledge, Miranda and I want to acknowledge a personal debt at this point, because when we came here nearly 20 years ago, we weren't burnt out, but we'd been uh, by then um, living and working in Portugal for nearly uh, 14 years and then we'd been living out of a suitcase for two. We'd been working with small and struggling churches in the south of Europe. We had been hanging on to our commitments and our faith, sometimes by our fingernails. And when we arrived here at Regent, um, through our, basically because a tall ship hauled up in the harbour in Portima in the south of Portugal and a bunch of people got off and told us about Regent and told Regent about us and we ended up um, showing them kingfishers being banded, but also hearing about region. When we came here, 
what we found immediately was this was our community of the journey. This here at Regent was being framed, like you're now reframing, um, a really coherent, honest, authentic theology for what we had been caring about all those years. And um, we, we personally, and Arosha, owe Regent a huge debt, actually, for that, for that equipping. But, but it's funny that you were trying from within the Christian subculture to make those connections, and we were trying from within the secular world to m mine the religious roots of everything, and the two come together in that common project, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, one of the issues this raises, I think, is where, how do, how do we title uh, an organization like Arasha, because I think a lot of people have a certain criteria for looking at whether Arasha is Christian or not, and what it means to even be a Christian organization. What, yeah. How do you how do you sort of grapple with that critique from probably both sides of the ledger on the Christian side of it? Given what yeah. like we've been talking about, the lordship of Christ in all areas, really. Yeah. Well, first of all, language really, really matters. Yeah. And the problem is Arosha functions in 15 languages, I don't know what. And I, I have no idea what Arosha is saying around the most, most of the time because I don't read Chinese. And, mm -hmm. and uh, anyway, so we had to think what label to put on this place that we then had as our Arosha Center. There was a vivid debate. Do we put Christian Environmental Center, in which case everybody in France thinks you're a cult? Do, do, you know, what do you do with the language? And, we realize that we don't have to explain ourselves on labels. We will explain ourselves as people come and live with us and work with us. And that's how they find out the content of the word Christian. Yeah. So we've taken a slow growth, organizationally nightmarish route to saying, if you want to know what Christian means, live with us for a year. Yeah. And Regent, as I've always understood it, has done exactly the same. Yeah. You can't package it, post it, advertise it, label it. It's life. Anyway. Let's talk about the Bible. Yes. Can we do that? Yes. Um, I think if region had evolved in a different way, it probably would have emphasized people uh, going out and doing good things in the culture, taking this Lordship of Christ, the depth and breadth of it, bringing it out to the entire world, to the entire culture, every profession can be done by a Christian with some limitations. Um, and it would have had a focus on the sort of skill, how-to, pragmatic approach to the culture, which is fairly fashionable even today, and it was in the 60s as well. Regent went another route, which was to say that the way we're going to do that, and the way we're going to prepare people to go out is that they would be people of the book. And like all major world religions, uh, we are people of the book. But it wasn't just people of the, the one book, but it was people of many books. And so a rooting in scripture and in the story of scripture and scripture being the grid through which all is understood became very formational for region. And many theological schools, as per the title, uh, theology is actually the core, and the Bible is sort of built on that. Whereas Regents had this long history of the Bible being central, and not the theology is built on the Bible, but the, the foundation, we believe, is Scripture and our understanding of Scripture. So I was trying to think, even just preparing for tonight, about a recent conversation. I was talking to one of our grads recently, and he had been a pastor before he had come here, and in his own words, knew his Bible, which is a phrase I always get nervous about when people say, I know my Bible, as if you know you could finally master it one day. Uh, he said, I knew my Bible, but I thought I needed to come to theological school to sharpen my skills in speaking, so I would be a better speaker. And when he tells his story of going through his experience here, his entire life, has been completely rearranged because of the way he understands the Bible now. So it wasn't that he came here, I mean, I think he did come here in order to learn skills and do something because he knew the Bible, but he realized that he didn't fully grasp scripture. It wasn't really where he was rooted, and his doing was very much separated from being deeply rooted in scripture and what scripture's about. 
And that no and Rick talks about it in this reframe as well. That that idea that's very crucial for us here that the biblical story must be the foundation of our own story. And if they get separated out, you simply become a well-meaning pragmatist that doesn't have much depth. And usually it's a bit like marriage, you know, one of the highest divorce times is five to seven years, because you don't you haven't got much left to carry on. <laughs> And I think a lot of people go out and start doing and getting very pragmatic and utilitarian. They don't have any depth. And by the five to seven year mark, they flame out, burn out, whatever. Arasha, as I know it, and my knowing you is a friend as well, this is very consistent with who you are as well. You're not simply being environmentalists in some sort of a pragmatic way, but it's deeply rooted in the biblical story. Mm. So tell us a little bit about that. How does that play out for a Russian for you and a Russian. I'd like to say two things about that. I think the first thing is to realize that, of course, the Bible is a work of art. Mm -hmm. And works of art read us. We, we don't just read them. So we are wanting scripture to read us. And that's very, very uncomfortable because, of course, we come to it culturally, we come to it with a historical lens and all the rest. And it's shocking to me because I grew up, Miranda and I are very different in this respect. I grew up in that biblical you know, in that evangelical world, and would have thought I knew the Bible, you know, from dot, and all of these meaningless competitions that you're put through to show you yeah. know the Bible. And, and, with, um, with chocolate as a reward? Uh, yeah, gosh, yeah. you were in the right kind of church. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> we just got beaten if we got it wrong, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got, when I learned scripture, I got chocolate bars. You did? And I'm like what? Pa what Pavlov's church? dogs now. I wouldn't be yeah. here tonight if I'd have been in yeah. your church, but yeah. anyway, that's, uh, that's a whole story. <laughs> Yeah, so, but what's alarming to me, honestly, when we started the Russia journey, we, I, I really thought we would scrabble around to find a few minor prophets that might mention the old frog or two, you know, that would be our infrastructure. <laughs> and I had no idea that there's this enormous creation to new creation narrative, and that the punchline of most of the prophets is, therefore the land mourns, which incidentally, in Hosea, is a climate change word. It's really a drying up, it's a withering. Uh, Hebrew is my deep love and you know the big sadness this afternoon was that wasn't a class I could crash because I'm doing it all on my own but there's a wonderful app by the way um, anyway we won't go there but, <laughs> which we can improve but it, but the Bible is reading us is the first thing to say second thing to say is talk about pragmatism the environmental world is racked with you know give us your money and we will save this species it's rubbish most of the time all the graphs are going in the wrong direction most, about 50% of, trust me, of really well-designed conservation projects fail for reasons outside their control. Nobody knows what climate change is going to do to any of this stuff because you, you protect a species in an area and the climate changes and it no longer works for it. So you've got all the habitat and none of the climate. You know, there's problems. This is really problematic for, for pragmatists in the conservation world. Now, why we are saved by the Bible is, why are we doing this? Because... It makes total sense to God. He loves it and he's asked us to do it. We leave the results really to him. Mm. So it's a, it's a biblical enterprise. We're just mm. being faithful to what this book is actually about, which is to be human is to care for the creation, mm. that Jesus died for all of it, not just the people in it, that the redemption is going to come to the whole thing, even drilling down to nematodes, got to get them in somewhere. You know, that it's a huge story of redemption within which we find our little place. So if it weren't for the Bible, I wouldn't be getting out of bed any longer because the environmental enterprise pragmatically seen is really like sitting at the bedside of a dying friend. And if you're not a Christian, you're going to do that despairingly. And if you're going to be a Christian environmental person, you're doing it in the hope of the resurrection of the material. That's the work of the Christian environmentalist. Unless something enormous changes, and a lot isn't going to change because it's baked in now with climate change. So, you know, amen for biblical enterprises. Yeah. And, and best of luck to any pragmatist because it's going to be a very hard road. Yeah. Yeah. But, Let's talk a little bit about theology, uh, just briefly. Um, one of the things that I think we have, t 
taken pretty seriously a region over the 45 years we've been around is understanding the whole creation story rather than starting at the fall. And it seems to me one of the, one of the problems the evangelical world has because of our, our particular emphasis on the gospel is we start with the fall and we recognize that sin has come and then we quickly want to go to redemption and then we want to get out of here as fast as we can and have the consummation occur. So it's a little bit like a hundred yard dash that if I can realize I'm a sinner, I can get redeemed, I can get out of here fast. And a lot of our hymns, a lot of our choruses are actually premised on that kind of notion. It's all about, I'm a sinner, I've got saved, my needs for forgiveness have been met, and now I need to get on to the other side as fast as I can. And of course, that, that's appealing at some levels to some people, but it totally disregards the way the Bible is set out and the way theology is set out, that creation is in fact the beginning and if you start your theological framework at the fall and ignore creation, you've ignored a massive amount in terms of what God intended to be good. And we want to start with what's bad and then get redemption going quickly and, and totally ignore all the good that's happened. And then if we do go to creation, we often only take the creation of people. And I think we're not terribly serious about the first five days. Uh, you know, something happened there, you know, all these creatures in the ocean. but. You know, that's, that's not really important. Like, how are those souls going to get saved? So we're not really interested in them. And what that does, it seems to me, is move us into a space where we only take part of the Bible seriously. We either ignore the other side, or we minimize it to such a degree that the first five days of creation don't even matter anymore. It's all going to be burned up because we want to get out of here fast anyway. Mm -hmm. And that skews the whole way you read Scripture. So when we come to Romans 8, the whole creation is groaning. Uh, that's a lot bigger than just the human experience. I mean, that's very much speaks into the world you're in as well. So that whole recognition that it's creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and taking all those seriously and not fragmenting them apart. How, how do you, I mean, you're a creation, conservation, preservation, Organization, so you're taking this really seriously, this big picture. Yeah, and it's a lot easier for us now. Um, I'm old enough now that we've been doing this over 30 years to have seen some of the big changes in in theology, and many of which have been birthed here in Regent and its Regent people that have led on this. But I would say there's a massive difference now in the sense that we understand our community with the wider creation, people like Richard Balcom. And, N.T. Wright and others, you know, friends, lots of friends of Regent who've been, or Regent faculty, Rick Watts, Ian Proven, and supremely Lauren Wilkinson have really brought us to understand, we share a day of creation incidentally as humans, we don't even have one to ourselves, but, the, but there's a sense of not a partners from, but, but community with, which the biblical text in all its seriousness gives us. So that's a big change, and it's a change of posture. But also understanding the collateral damage of a weak understanding of creation. And this was of great practical importance for Miranda and I, because in the first center at Arosha, and this is now continued with all the, with all the Arosha centers around the world, the us and them mentality that you inevitably end up with, if you start your story with, are you a saved person or aren't you a saved person? You're in two psychological communities right off the bat, us and them. It's inevitable. If you start your story with, we are, like Paul in Acts 7, we are God's offspring, says, says Paul in Acts, 7, Acts 17, you, you, you're in a situation of automatic community. You make community with all comers because you are community. And, and furthermore than that, that hospitality or that community is extended by the, the biblical text to the whole creation, the whole living. Well, if you look at the first covenant that is made in Genesis 9, it's the, the covenant between God and all of life, and it just gets stressed seven times, between all of life, between all creatures. It's a, it's a hospitable covenant to the whole of creation. So for us, this shift in theology has been of enormous practical importance. Mm. It's, a, it's given us our foundation for community. It's given us, given us uh, our understanding of why other living things matter. And it's placed us in our right place um, of course, with a unique 
role within creation as human, a very special role, but nevertheless connected in a way that the older theologians didn't. And as to the lifting us out of here, all the, all the wonderful biblical scholarship that's been done to understand the arrival of the new creation. And I think we've got to be a bit bolder about this. I think it is, I used to think Arosha would not get into eschatology because it's just too divisive and difficult. Let's not even go there. And you know, you believe what you like, it doesn't really matter. I think it actually really does matter. And I think now we ought to go out to bat every Sunday for the New Jerusalem coming and for the words that are used of the renewal of creation and the resurrection of the body rather than just new from nothing somewhere else on some other planet. Because frankly, the culture is treating this planet as though we had somewhere else to go to, and we don't. Yeah. And it's never going to happen. So that change in biblical theology, which has happened, I think needs popularizing yeah. and, and operationalizing, as it were, through the churches now. But the theological work, as far as Russia is concerned, correct me if I'm wrong, Marco, and the other warriors here, Paul Career and John, and, I mean, I think the theological work has been done. I think the real question is, what does it look like when, it, when, it, when it's on the ground? Yeah. And, and there isn't much scalable evidence of this wonderful th new theology out there. Yeah. Not yet. That's, that's, for me, the big task. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the theological work is essentially, I mean, there's some nice stuff still to do. For example, how about the insight that Jesus' DNA uh, may have had elements within it of loads of extinct species from millions of years before, but let's not talk about that. I mean, there's interesting <laughs> speculative PhDs out there, uh, but, um, but you know, I can come and talk to you afterwards if you want to think of some leading edges for environmental theology. Um, um, uh, but, but basically, the real need, I think, for Regent and for Arosha is to have really theologically, biblically informed projects that change places so the landscape looks different mm. and, and, then, and, the, and the species are, are flourishing. And so your vision of business is generating businesses that lead biodiversity better and not worse. We haven't got hardly any of those on Earth. Yeah. What a great challenge, you know. And I think part of that is to get away from that old theory practice notion that you go to school to learn theory. Yeah and then you go out and practice. And I think the best education is done where the theory is informed by practice yeah. and the practice is informed by theory and they go back and forth. We had, a, we had an interesting experience here last April. We had a reporter uh, from the Sydney Herald newspaper came here because the new premier of New South Wales in uh, Australia, Mike Baird, is, 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 is a region grad. And uh, his chief of staff is a region grad as well. So the, the Sydney Herald was quite interested that there's these two people that have theological training that are now in the premier's office. And it was actually the headline in the paper in the Sydney Herald uh, after he interviewed a number of people here, came to graduation, picked up a whole lot of things, was uh, his, his line was, Mike Baird is now in the premier's office, but there will also be a new influence in the office, colon, Jesus Christ which is an interesting perspective mm. from somebody mm. out there in the so-called yeah. secular political world reporting mm. on what's going on in politics. And you've had these experiences, because we've done some of them together, where you go into some of these business offices where there's significant influence for Christ going on. That needs to inform our theological understanding, not just receive our theological understanding. It seems to me that needs to be a, a reciprocal process. Yeah. And I still think Re Regent is a unique place for people to come and, and really uh, mine those seams yeah. globally. And I was in Manila um, for a, a thing and I, I found the Regent influence there. And it's the same in Singapore and it's the same yeah. in so many places. And, and I just think you've got to keep on doing what you do and do it more because the dilemmas that people face in those contexts, those business contexts, are systemic. That they're not just about personal spirituality. For example, the real problem for environment and business is all about time. The reporting is done quarterly. The remuneration of the chief execs is done on a very short time. None of it fits with ecology at all. So if you want to change that, you're up against a juggernaut of a system. And if you don't have a really great toolkit that Regent has given you, you're going to buckle. If you've got a personal piety toolkit, it's going to last you day two. And, I, and actually, this is official, talking about the press. The Independent in the UK, which is a national um, newspaper of 
some seriousness, noticed that a lot of the time now it's Christians running um, banks and stuff in, in, in Britain, in senior positions. Uh, and they went out and talked to some of them. And, and what was interesting was that <clears throat> it seems Christians in the corporate world keep their head down till they're about 40 because they have to make so many compromises to survive until they're 40 in that environment that they just shut up about the Christian faith. It's, and it is systemic. One of the ways it works, for example, is that when they go to the city at the beginning, the people they work for put them into debt and then pay them with a massive bonus at the end of the year. So they own them for the year because they don't get that bonus. They're in so much debt um, with their life expectations that they can't find their way out. So during the year, they do what the boss says, you bet, because you're going to get two million and then up, or you're going to get 300,000 and you're out the door. And, and the, the reporter was saying, they only pop up when they're 40 because then they've got nothing to lose. And it's just tragic mm -hmm. that we have this weakness of, uh, of, of the Christian mind during those years. I know a few who've gone to the city and said, we're not going to go into debt, we're going to live poor, we're going to live simple, and we're going to keep our ability to say no. And we're meeting a few of them. But they need region, these, these people. And, and um, we've had so many sad moments where we've run an environmental conference in a country, invited a very high-profile environmental person from that country who is a Christian to speak, and they speak about their research, and then they talk about their faith, and their faith is this puny Sunday school expression. There's no integration, there's no uh, depth to the Christian reflection on their research area. Like you said in the reframe mm. film, you know, God doesn't just care about artists, he cares about the art. They don't reflect on the art, mm. and, and therefore the church is muted yeah. in its workplace. Yeah. And, and that's why Regent matters, and we try to, to get people here as much as we can. You know, our Portuguese biologists came, and mm -hmm. our Portuguese, you know, others as well. We, I wish we could do it more. Maybe this partnership with the uh, generous discount, Jeff, will help us you know, <laughs> to do that. You know, you, you're in these meetings sometimes as I am. Mm -hmm. I was in a meeting in Beijing two years ago with one of our grads, who's the COO of the Bank of Montreal in Beijing. And he decided, as is often the case when you go to Asia, you've done this too, you know, the big meals and lots of courses and lots of people. So he, he bought a bunch of his banking friends around the table. And some were followers of Jesus, some weren't. And he started telling his story about coming to Regent and what that was about and why he did. And just the interaction, people were saying to him, like, what does theology have to do with banking? And what does theology have to do with money? And what does theology have to do with the fact you're a CEO in a major bank in Beijing? Like, how do these even relate to one another? And just to hear him being forced out of that sort of secular mindset to articulate what, how these things connect, mm -hmm. these things that are normally fragmented. It was one of those, those moments you wish you had it on video so you could use it, because it was just powerful to listen to him make those kind of links practically. Yeah. And that's when you get joy and graduation in these kind of places to see people doing that. Yeah, yeah, and to recognize it's a long journey and, yeah. and it's a struggle and there aren't any clear answers. I, for theological profundity, I listen to my two-year-old grandchildren here and um, the, um, the one who's currently giving me most to think about theologically is called Eli and he lives in the East End of London so he talks like this, Dunnies, you know, uh, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's what he says <laughs> in it being what, anyway. So Eli has two words for the whole of life. Uh, when things are going really well, he says, oh, it's epic. And when it's going really badly, he says, carnage. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think um, Regent grads leave this place uniquely expecting it to be epic and carnage. Yeah. And I think they leave other places because they've never really engaged with the huge difficulty of these questions, they think it's all going to be epic. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really do think uh, it's, it's uh, as Rick was saying on your video about the Bible, but no, Eugene was saying it, wasn't it, so beautifully, nobody's excluded, you know, yeah. the carnage is not excluded. Yeah. No heroes. No heroes. Yeah. And anybody who's actually tried to do anything with the material world knows it just doesn't obey the rules, you know, it just won't come to order. And, um, and any, you know, this is one of the things that 
frustrates the bits out of you with the conservation. So we had a rare big purple gallinule in Portugal in a very small area and it really needed protecting. Uh, a gallinule, by the way, is like a big purple duck, basically, but a lot more exciting. And, um, <laughs> and so they, they tried to protect this thing, so they fenced off the, the, the marsh where it was, but you know, the problem was the marsh was only a marsh because all the cattle were actually getting through the fences and chewing it all up and keeping it a marsh. So as soon as they protected it, the trees grew up and the gallinules left. Um, and this happens all the time with the material world. It's, it's carnage and, and things eat each other, you know, that you, um, anyway, there's whole stories we could tell about that, but <laughs> I, I think. Uh, they're going to they're gonna come up and tell us to stop soon. So yeah, I, have, I have one more question for you. Yeah. I hear you're working on a book. Gosh, that, time has flown. Yes. <laughs> Is that true? We are, Rod. Oh, I, I, I have you. been and you're about to. <laughs> <laughs> So this book you're working on with this other co-author, what, what's the book about? Hmm. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Uh, we're always, Rod and I are always roaming the earth looking for unredeemed areas. And <laughs> money... Maybe that's what you're doing. Uh, but. <laughs> that's the only explanation for where I find you. Yeah, um, <laughs> so one of the... And, and one of the areas is money. We don't talk about it well, we don't live it well, it's surrounded by anxiety. It does for us things that money shouldn't do. It's very practically difficult. And many of the students here at Region, particularly those from Asia, will know what I'm talking about with this. And, and so, uh, and we have had the, you know, the, the, the responsibility of putting the money wheels on the wagons of our organizations over the years. And we've exchanged, haven't we, many stories about that. And so we just felt it was time to, um, be honest and, and talk about money and raising money from the point of view of all its relationships, didn't we? Mm -hmm. That's what I think I'm doing with you on this. Yeah. Uh, are you doing that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. So that, so that we can live our relationship with God, money and people better and, and so that we can lead our organizations financially in a way that honors the creator who is abundant but seems to just give you peanuts most of the time. <laughs> and why is that? Um, so. Should we do an offering right now, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Voila. Yeah. You guys ready? He was telling me to shut up in that nice Canadian way. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, whoop, thank you, guys. And uh, the time's come for us to have questions. And there are those microphones at the back. I'm going to ask one to... Uh, get you off the hook out there, folks. Uh, so while you think about those, let me ask. So this is a, goes back to the map um, that we had up there for a while. And then we had Marku's name quite a bit. That was, that was nice. <laughs> nice to see. We know how to spell it, too. Two Ks. Uh -huh. And then another K. But uh, the map was quite fascinating. So what, one of the things I was thinking about looking at that map was the cultural diversity that's represented by that map as well. And, and you uh, were saying you've got 15 different languages or, or whatever that Russia is doing its, its work in. What, what's your observation as to the international character of your work? And I'm just thinking that different cultures around the world have had very different historic cultural stories about relationship to land than we have in Western cultures, you know, Northern European and, and North American cultures. And do you see that, that the church has a better, in a sense, handle on the creation care themes on account of a kind of cultural resonance in certain places? Or is it really just a story of, of carnage, to use your word, pretty much equally everywhere that the church has to, has to face? That's a super good question. Uh, again, I think the region posture uh, has taught me to embrace culture and to realize that gospel always comes enculturated. There's no distilled, there's no distilled gospel. So we bring culture to it, not reluctantly, but joyfully. We, 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 but at the same time, we exegete culture, don't we? And we, we, no culture is golden. And I think it's very dangerous for those like Miranda and I who live cross-culturally. Your, your natural um, instinct is to baptize the culture you've gone into and it can do no wrong. But frankly, Portuguese men are really bad at washing up and macho and difficult. And, you know, there, there are things about Portuguese culture that are not great, and the French, dare one say it, you know, that are not, 
totally wonderful. And even the British culture might have its odd flaw. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, why it's complicated, I'll give you an example from our family. We have a son living in the middle of the South Atlantic with his family, a daughter living in Kenya with her family, but the most cross-cultural of our daughters is living in London because everybody on her estate comes from the Silet province of Bangladesh. And they're kept up all night during uh, Ramadan. And it's just so, because you know the, the biggest Japanese church in the world is in Rio de Janeiro, I think. And it, the biggest church in London is a Nigerian church now. So culture's odd and always has been much odder incidentally than despite the rising and dangerous nationalist movements throughout the world and particularly in Europe now that we have to stand against. You know, we are not ethnically, eneth you know, we've always been this huge mix. So it's complicated. But in summary, what Arosha wants to do is where, and this is why we kept the Portuguese name for Arosha, where cultures are close to biblical commitments, we want to celebrate and embrace them and bring them within. And where they've got destructive gospel consequences, we want to have an honest conversation in our community, which is a cross-cultural one like yours is. And one of the ways to do that was to favor a non-Anglo-Saxon identity for the organization. So we've made strenuous efforts to, to be, and one of our commitments is to being cross-cultural. I think another aspect of that too, and you and I have talked about this, Peter, is um, in Asia, generally, um, and certainly in China, the, the secular sacred split is still pretty deep in the church. And so my experience in Asia is that the environment is outside the purview of the Christian mind. And many people there, and I'm not, I'm not this isn't an impression, I've, this has been said to me, Many people there see their work in the secular world as trying to get people converted. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is render anything that's outside the private experience of Christian faith into the public experience of Christian faith is solely for the purpose of conversion. Makes it pretty difficult to be an, an anesthetist too, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just wanted to, oh dear. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I find, and I mean, you've had that experience as well, like it's that, what you're trying to talk about is difficult in that kind of a culture where the reason we're here is to save souls. Yeah, but why I'm still coming to North America is the tap root of all of this is North American dispensationalist theology. Yeah. You find it in Nairobi, you find it in Hong Kong, you find it everywhere, but if you drill down just a generation, it was basically North Americans for the most part who went there and said the place doesn't matter and yeah. the only thing is you're lifting off and going to heaven. So, you know, I, it matters globally that region gets it right. Thank you. First question over here. And then we'll go over there. Hi there. Um, one of the difficulties I have when I'm thinking about uh, the environment and the environmental movement and things like that is that it strikes me that everything in life has a cost, not necessarily a monetary cost. And I have yet to see a, a compelling way of examining those costs when we're looking at either a development project that has an environmental cost or an environmental project that has a human cost. And I was wondering if you could share with me how you think about that, um, how you measure that cost and how we compromise in those cases when we can't have 100% satisfaction for uh, people or for the environment or whether you think that it's possible to have both in all cases? Again, a very good question. Uh, to your sadness, you haven't really got the right person in the room to answer it at the project and program level because I was always really bad at that. And that's a community, you, you need our ops people here for that. But I would just go back to biblical theology that um, the world was made good, not perfect. And we see that throughout ecology, I believe. And, um, but essentially, we believe God made the world to work. So I, I, we are, Arosha is automatically suspicious when people come up and say, it's, it's an either or here. It's either jobs or it's, do you know, that paradigm. Because our theological, biblical conviction is probably not. We just haven't been smart enough to get the win-win to work. 
And so we are always looking for the win-wins. And the way we do that is extensive, ground-up, incarnational project design from the communities and from the places. Because people come up with really good ideas. And I'll just give you one example of a project which might have started from where you're talking about. It, on the, and please forgive me, those of you who are familiar with this, because I talk about it a lot, and Miranda and I have been, have been there a bit, and we're going to be there again soon. The Kenyan coastal forest that was in that video was 4,000 kilometers long from Mozambique uh, to Somalia. And it's down to 40 kilometers with many of the species within it. Just, And people are still, were still, chopping it down. And you could say they're hungry, they're, it's a desperately poor place. Of course they're chopping it down because it's all they can do. It's either human development or uh, Sokoki Skopsal and Clark's Weaver and the elephant shrew and all, you know. It's an either or, it's clear. But actually, the community with time revealed why they were doing it, which was to pay school fees. Because if you don't get secondary schooling in Kenya, you're really in the poverty trap, and so you sell it for carvings and charcoal. And it was a, it was a one-way street. They knew the climate change when the forest had gone. They, they knew the soils were depleted, and they knew it was, but, but that was the only way. And so to design a savvy project and make the forest the banker for the school fees was the objective, and we did it by training forest guides, getting tourists in there, all the money goes to school fees, all the forest adjacent communities replant the forest because they know it's the banker and it works and we've done it for 12 years and there are 400 plus kids now you know in the program or finished and graduated from university equal gender split girls and boys and, and it works but it was all a council of despair at the beginning and if you went there and saw the desperate poverty you'd think good luck to them for chopping the forest i would do the same but if you start from a theological confidence, Psalm 67 is really showing us that, that may God be gracious to us and bless us so that your ways may be known on earth. You know, it's, it's, it's operationable. And our conviction is those costs can be met in ways that meet the requirements of justice that are in the character of God. And it gives us confidence to keep chipping away at project design until we get a good one that works always round. And I never really believe it when people say it's an either or. And I think there should be more zero tolerance about biodiversity loss for a million reasons, but not least because we're disbelieving God. If the only way you can run a good business is by devastating the earth, stop now. Thank you. Next question's over here on the other side. Uh, thank you, Rod and Peter, for an uh, important introduction to this, this, this um, crucial topic. Mine, mine is more a comment that I, uh, from an email conversation I had with a friend in Costa Rica. So if, if I may read his comment, and just I, I'd like to hear your, your inputs uh, related to that. Very much acknowledging that, yeah, we need to resist this uh, kind of pragmatist utopianism that we can build the kingdom of heaven on earth, and um, so I, I want to frame that in, in the, like with that um, within that that context that the earth is good, but it's not perfect yet. Um, so he says uh, basically, Eduardo, I confess that it is it, it is worrisome the situation in our church. It is painful to see how pastors with the best intentions continue to be blinded towards the effect of the economic system. Um, even though it's good to do efforts of conservation and some pastors support this, uh, nothing is heard in our, in our churches uh, or in NGOs in, in respect to resisting consumption, apathy, eg egoism, and um, greed. Sorry, I'm, I'm translating as I go, so. Hablo uh, español. Hablo español, que bueno. Sí, claro. <laughs> Se lo leo en español. Hablo español, Eduardo. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right. Stay with the English. Okay. Uh, I'll try the French. Let's see how it goes. Um, we're in Canada, right? So, anyway. Uh, I don't know how it, how it is in Canada, but here, pastors and NGOs, I feel, have the, their hands tied up. They can't risk to be very vocal. Something impedes them from criticizing capitalism. I think it is by fear to lose uh, donors 
or people in their congregations or just to be labeled uh, as a Marxist. I don't know if it's by fear or simply because they are blind, uh, but whatever it is, nobody speaks about in parallel to building these green alternatives uh, that we have to resist and dismantle the truths of this economic system that is heartless and depraved. I wish we can overcome our fears and take heart in Christ to suffer as we bear witness to the gospel. Uh, that's how he puts it. M my question would be, well, number one, what, what do you think of that? And number two, honoring the full biblical story, how would you see a, a new exodus play out, play t itself out in the world? And also, could you comment on the possibility of a social exorcism? Let me tackle a couple of things there, and then I'll pass it to you, Peter. Um, Eduardo, you always ask good questions. It's one of your spiritual gifts. Um, first of all, I think we need to recognize that the problem that we, we have in the church, not just in Costa Rica, but around the world, is not about money and sex, it's about power. It's really power is the problem, and when you turn the triangle on its end, it's the power at the bottom that, ser that serves the issues around money and sex. And so I think there's still a lot of people walking around thinking money and sex is our issue and our problems, and when pastors fall or leaders fall, it's always about money and sex. But implicit in both of those is power. And one of the reasons sex and money have such a, a draw and are so compelling and intoxicating is because of the power embedded in them. So a lot of those stories that you describe, um, and this often happens in places that don't have a lot of wealth and don't have a lot of material goods, the power dynamics get very much tied to the money and mission follows money. And once that happens in a system, it gets all skewed. And that's not a Costa Rica problem, that's a problem raising money for Regent, that's a problem raising money for Russia. If money starts leading mission, rather than mission seeking money. And if we don't understand philanthropy for what it is, it is, it is for the common good. It's for the good of humanity. It's in our, it's, the giving is a, is a human enterprise, but it's ultimately about worship. And I think once we get into churches where money is serving a power base, and then pastors who are in those positions of authority um, feel like they can't have conviction, they can't live by principle, they can't uh, articulate what they really believe because the money is drawing them. The whole thing is upside down. And it's, I mean, confronting that, to me, that's, that's a demonic issue. That's, the, that's a principalities and powers issue. And I think one of the reasons the gospel talks so much about power, and you and I have talked about this personally in the past, I think one of the reasons the gospel, there's so much talk about power is because those things need to be dismantled because they are principalities and powers that are functioning in a very evil way. Um, and sometimes prophets need to rise up and speak into that directly and be honest about it and call it for what it is and detach mission and money because if that chronology gets wrong, Region College, Arasha, some of the churches in Costa Rica will fall pretty badly. That's not an exhaustive answer to the question, but that would be my first pass at it. I heard the big question in there about, about um, capitalism. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, th this, is, this is a very important discussion. Um, I think there is now a climate of self-criticism within capitalism. I think the failures of capitalism are becoming blatant, particularly the externalities which have never been on the balance sheet. And we're building up levels of ecological debt and other things which are blindsiding the whole enterprise. But I think the temptation is that pragmatic thing you, you mentioned is to think, well, some other system will be our salvation. Now, as Christians, we know we have a redeemer who is Jesus Christ. And so what we need is to both believe in the possibilities of reformation within capitalism, to call it capitalism with a human face, call it green capitalism, the green economy, whatever, you know, or to look at the 
Christian resources within other economic systems, but to, to think that we're going to see the emergence of a savior economic system that supersedes capitalism is, is idolatry for the same reasons that Rod said. And I just want to add a practical footnote that we in Arosha and Regent I think have followed and which we need to hold dear. You need to design structures that subvert that power dynamic at the start. So we decided we wouldn't have a headquarters that our staff would live in the field communities and we still don't have a headquarters. I went to a conservation organization that will remain nameless um, in, in the US recently and boy, I was blown away. The massive building and screens and people at desks and computers. Ah. On the way out, I grabbed their annual report. Their budget was exactly the same as ours and they had the same number of people globally working for them as, as we did. But, you know, the fact that the structure, the power, you know, in the CEO's office, you know, you could play cricket on his desk. <laughs> now, we've, we've designed a structure of community. The people of God are called to do this. So Arosha is this very flat organization. We don't have any head honchos, despite the fact that I've been sitting here tonight. It's just I drew the short straw. You know, we're not that sort of an organization. We're not. We serve each other, and we've deliberately built institutions to subvert power. And I think, given our fallen ability to grab the limelight and power, and we have to be intentional about organizational design. Right. Uh, yeah. It's a very inadequate answer. We, why don't we carry on afterwards? Which gives me a chance to say our time tonight has come to an end. The clock runs quickly. Thank you for being here and for a really rich evening. And let's thank Peter and Rod for their contribution.